For the last two weeks, the Lord has pressed upon my heart to study this wonderful book in the New Testament. And when I came to chapter 3 last week, I said, we have to go here. And that's the way it should be. The word should drive a man to the pulpit. He shouldn't be driven by his own desires or anything else. The word of God should drive a man to tell others about it. And this past week, as I refreshed my mind over these passages of Scripture in the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians, I continued to not be able to plunge the depths of the riches of these three chapters. In this past week, there has been much to discourage. There has been many questions brought to the mind of Christian and non-Christian. We look to society and we say, what is happening? The evangelical church has been flipped on its head by a term, social justice, has been dividing the churches. It's almost as if the church doesn't even know where to go. How is it that we have allowed us ourselves to get to this point? What have we failed to do? How is there discouragement in the pew? How is there discouragement in the pulpit? Have we forgotten the power of the God whom we serve? Have we forgotten the power of this gospel to unite men in the pew and throughout the world? Have we forgotten this power that is in this holy word? I think we have. I think that we have left off the anchorage. We've brought so many other things before our eyes that we are stumbling at our own stumbling blocks. You look at Corinth. This was a very wicked, wicked city in a very wicked time. It was located in Greece, located on a four-mile-wide isthmus of land, but about 48 miles away from Athens. We have all heard where Athens is. Athens is where the Olympic Games have taken place. And in fact, Corinth had the Corinthian Games, also known as the Isthmus Games. They're second only to the Olympics. This was a, this was a huge trading post, part of the province known as Achaia, we read of in the book of Acts. Corinth was near the Acropolis. The Acropolis, which offered horrific and pagan worship throughout the Roman world. The Acropolis was known as the Temple of Aphrodite, the so-called goddess of love, where thousands of temple priestesses, so-called, would perform acts of prostitution in this temple. Corinthian church was founded by Paul in the second missionary journey. And the culture had grossly infiltrated the church at Corinth. Carnality and immaturity, fractions and divisions, cliques existed. Some followed Paul. Some followed Apollos. Others followed Peter. Some followed Christ. Sexual immorality of unmatched magnitude were present within this church. They had allowed the world to infiltrate. While the desires of the people were to be entertained by worldly and Greek orators, they had taken place in preaching, that had taken place of preaching the word of God. Paul had his hands full with this Corinthian church. He wrote this epistle in response to a letter that was sent by the Corinthian church concerning marriage and food and meats offered to idols. And in return, the church was hammered by the gospel guns of the Apostle Paul. This book was written in around, uh, around 55 AD. Paul wrote this letter from Ephesus. There was another letter that was actually written by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, and it, is not, it has not been found today. It's there, therefore deemed not inspired. But the Apostle makes a mention of it, and it's known as the Lost Epistle. 
Though we don't have that in our Bibles today, there was another letter that we do not know about. There was also an even uh, a, letter, a letter between First and Second Corinthians, which is known as the severe letter. Given the historicity of this wicked city, and it would later coin its own term in a degrading remark, it would be known as the Corinthianizers. And to Corinthianize meant that you would take part in, in huge amounts of drunkenness and sexual immorality and you would be deemed a Corinthianizer. And as we look at the world and the society in which we live today, we say, what is going on with this immorality? It's the same thing that Paul was dealing with in the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was unable to divorce the world from their midst. And not much has changed. The church today has allowed the world to dictate what goes on inside the church walls. The gospel has been watered down and even avoided in many terms. And the preaching of the cross has been replaced with light shows and theatrics. This letter to the Corinthians is a letter for the church today. To avoid the wisdom of this world and pursue the wisdom of God and to start living like Christ has called us to live in a godless world. The first point that I have for you this morning from this text is the world's wisdom is foolishness to God. The world's wisdom is foolishness to God. Literally, in the Greek, that word means moronic. It's moroni. That word foolish is moronic to God. The world's wisdom is foolishness to God. That means having no biblical worldview. Everything is seen for the Christian to be brought to light by God's word. As a Christian, our heart has been so changed to such a degree that we see through the, gla the glasses of the Bible, through the spirit of the Lord, of the, word, the spirit of God leading and guiding us through every single day of our lives, we hold, as Christians, we hold a biblical worldview. I can't imagine the void in someone's heart and mind who does not know Christ. I praise God that I can barely remember what it was like to not know him. The void that takes place. Imagine getting to such a point where you believe that there's no eternity. That you are nothing but a, an evolved man, uh, animal, and when you go into the ground, that's it. Imagine if this life was all that you had. This is it. And this is what Paul addresses in the book of Ephesians and later here in 1 Corinthians. He says, why not just ink, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Isn't that the cry of society today? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. What's it all for anyway? This past week, I had an amazing opportunity to witness to two, two and three individuals, unsaved men, it was a blessing. And the cry of their lost heart is the same. Listen to what they said. This was past this past week, and, and just having the Lord open an opportunity to share the gospel. The cry of both of these men was just stay on your side of the fence, preacher. You mind your own business. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. Now, in nice terms, that's a way of saying shut your mouth. Who are you to tell me that I'm going to hell? Preachers today are afraid to say that. We've left off the truth of the word. Stay on your side of the fence. What you believe isn't what I believe, and let's just leave it at that. Let's just agree to disagree. This is the other remark, another remark, the remark, the second remark that one of these men said to me is, that is just a book of stories 
that doesn't apply to today. Talking about the Bible. Well, the Word of God says that it is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It does not change. And I find it very interesting that a book as simple as 1 Corinthians is directly applicable to today. 2,000 years later. This book pierces the heart, friends. This is the other remark. A third remark that they said is, I can interpret. And, and as I say these remarks to you, I want you to question if you've ever thought this. This is the third the remark that one of these men said to me is that I can interpret the Bible any way that fits me. Now that's false. Peter says that the Bible is left to no private interpretation. You see, friends, we have a big issue today where we have people that are reading this Bible and say, well, I take it to mean this, and you take it to mean that. Let's just agree to disagree. That is false. This word means one thing. There's not multiple truths found in this. There's one truth. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the beautiful golden thread that every, as, the, as it is said, that all roads lead to run, London, all texts lead to the cross. The fourth point that one of these men said to me this past week is, Jesus, and this just made my hair stand up on my head. Jesus was just a good old boy, and I like that. Let me tell you, friends, Jesus was not just a good old boy. Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God, the Son of God. He did no sin, and he bled and died for you. I know no good old boy that would do that. Jesus was not just a good old boy. Jesus was God made flesh, the sinless Lamb. The final thing that one of, these things, one of these men said to me, it breaks my heart, but paints the picture so clearly. And I quote, I think I'm all right. Do you know that a true Christian, that a Christian that we, as we gather here, do you know that to be a member of this church, you have to tell us that you're not all right? <laughs> To affirm Christ, you have to find that you are not okay, that you are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. You have to have been brought to that point where you have been broken through, I am not all right. And the only way that you will come to know that you are not okay is through this word, by his spirit. And we've abandoned it. We've abandoned it. Churches are packed full of people who think that they're okay. And they, want to go, they don't want to go to hell because they're just another good guy. They wouldn't send them to hell. Why would, why would we ever say, as Christians, I'm not a good guy? It's because we have been shown that we are sinners by the Spirit of God. A Christian affirms, I am. I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. Now, let me share some things with you this morning. I did a little bit of research into these. And this is, this is the cry of the land. And this is the mentality behind, don't you yell across your fence. You stay on your side of the fence. You know, you've got your religion and I've got mine. Why don't you just keep a hold of yours and I'll keep doing my own thing and we'll just see who gets to the right place at the end. Let me tell you that this is why that is false. Let me share with you if you, if you look at how do Buddhists get to heaven? How does a Buddhist get to heaven? Let's see what the Buddhists have to say. And this is pulled right off of the, uh, what they would affirm. They're, they're one of the enlightenment religions. They, they seek to have an enlightened mind to get them to nirvana. Heaven, quote, the belief in an afterlife where fully aware beings wander about in the presence of their deity 
is not a concept present in Buddhism. The closest Buddhists come to this belief is nirvana, a state where the final desire that of maintaining an independent belief in self is released. Key point there, be as good as you can be and just focus on you and you'll attain through your works nirvana. Hinduism. Hinduism is another polytheistic religion, meaning that they worship many gods, from rocks on the ground to statues that they make. They spin little boxes for prayer times. Worshiping statues and objects, they believe in reincarnation. They do not believe in a heaven or hell, a place of bliss where people merited good works are. In Islam, which is one of the fastest growing religions in the United States today, believes that if you keep the five pillars of the Islamic faith, obedience to Allah, prayer at least three times a day, giving alms, fasting during the month of Ramadan, and a pilgrimage to Mecca, you've made it. You gotta keep those five. Make sure that you do this. Those are your works and you'll make it to heaven. Science teaches that man is just a mere animal, that he has evolved from some sort of ooze. There is no life after death. There is no soul. There are many so-called Christian religions today that they teach faith in Christ plus works. Faith plus works. There are many so-called taking the name of Christ, Christians teaching that you have to have faith and you have to do this. Paul and Galatians confronted Peter on this very matter. And that's what I aim to put before you today. These so-called Christian churches teach that you have to have faith plus baptism. Faith plus the sacraments. Faith plus confessions. Faith plus do good. Do you know what Christianity, the Christianity of the Bible teaches? It is finished. How? How is it finished? This man upon a cross that cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, he actually cries out, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. This savior of the world is just a good old boy, really. Paid your debt. And let me, know, let me show you how we can take these other religions and say they are false. And you can stand on this truth and you can say that is not true. And we can trust the Bible because of the blood of Christ. There is no other religion out there that makes atonement for your sin for you. There is no other concept of a sinless lamb paying for the sins of his people. There's no other concept of justice. You want to define and smash social justice? It's found in the gospel. The power of the gospel. Let me share with you as well this. Ecclesiastes, you don't have to turn there, I'll share it with you. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 reads this. God has placed eternity in their hearts. And in John chapter 1, this is the light that lighteth all men that cometh into the world. Every man that is born in this world knows that there is an eternity. It's there. Now you can sear it with a, like a hot iron. You can harden your heart. You can harden your, your neck. You can become stiff-necked against this, as the atheists do. They say there's no afterlife, there is no God, which is a form of religion in and of itself. But we are born with a knowledge of life after death. And where does that come from? That life after death comes from what God has placed into every one of us. He tells us. 
that there is this, there is more than this. There is either life eternal with him through his son or an eternity in torment, hell, where the worm never dieth and there is gnashing of teeth. What a depiction, what a picture of hell where there's gnashing of teeth continually. And yet we have so many today who say that there is no afterlife, there is no eternity, this is all that there is, I go in the ground and that's it. It leads me to my second point is that godly wisdom, do you see how the, the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God? It's completely against the idea of God. The second point that I would like to make to you this morning is godly wisdom is foolishness to the world. Godly wisdom is foolishness to the world. And Paul says here in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, Let no man deceive himself, period. Take that sentence. Let no man deceive himself, period. Stop, pause, think about that. What did he just say? That a man can actually deceive himself if he's wise in this world. He can actually deceive himself. So think about the word deceive. Deceive is so simple to identify and to define. It says it's a fail to see. It's failure to see. It's to, to be deceived means to be tricked, to ensnare or cheat. The Greek word is exapateo, which means to seduce wholly, to beguile. Why would you ever do that to yourself? Because what God is saying is that if you seek to be wise in this world, you are actually deceiving yourself, putting a blindfold on, blinding your heart, blinding your eyes. You're actually a moron. If you're seeking the wisdom of this world, if you seek to be worldly, if you seek to invite the things of the world into the church and let that dictate who brings... Let me tell you, friends. Okay? You want... You want these pews packed? I can do it. We can do it. It's easy. You can put them shoulder to shoulder and overflowing and standing out the door if that's what you want to do. We can do it. All you got to do is just be like the world. Just be like the world. Do as many worldly things as you can possibly do, and you have to fight them off out of here with a stick. But if you want true conversion, if you want people's lives and hearts to be changed and, you, and God's power to be in your midst, you stick to the gospel. You stay to this word as if your life depended on it, and it does. Don't deceive yourself. Paul says, let no man deceive himself. When I was a kid, my brothers and I, my dad, for some reason, gave us those little metal uh, pressure traps that trappers use with their springs. And you stick them down and you keep the, the clutches open. And my brothers and I would set those traps. We were little kids. And we'd stick a stick in there and set it off and be like, ha, yeah, cool. Do you know what I began to think? What would happen if I stuck my finger in there? <laughs> and I did it. I completely deceived myself. I mean, with my brother standing around, I took my finger out and I'm like, bang. Ouch. What Paul is saying, that paints a beautiful picture. Don't. Don't take the wisdom of the world, set it open, and say, I can do that. It's going to bite you. When you want to be like the world, it is going to bite you. I try to tell the teens, this is a great advice from your pastor to the teens. Don't fit in. Don't go with the herd. Swim against the current, sand against the grain, don't fit in. You stand for the truth, 
and God will see you through. You can mark it down, write it down, take my word for it. God will see you through. And all over the world today, we're preaching fit in. Do whatever it takes to run with the herd. Can I share with you that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God and the wisdom that is of God is foolishness to this world? You will not be able to take the world in one hand and the gospel in the other and say, I've got it figured out. It just can't happen. You, we are gospel-centered, gospel-focused, Christ-exalting here in this church. And that is the only way Jesus will build a church. Let no man deceive himself. Self-deception is the worst kind of deception. It, it sings of stupidity. Have you ever done something that afterwards you said, that was dumb? Or you did something that says, why did I do that? Or well, hindsight's twenty twenty. Looking back, I really should have thought about that before I, I did this. By chasing worldly wisdom as the end gain to be like the world, it's, it's kind of like if you would say, if I pursue vast amounts of knowledge and experiences and have no knowledge of God, I have only succeeded in becoming a fool in the eyes of God. Seeking intellectual enlightenment le leaves uh, many voids. Well, what about if, you're, if, if enlightenment and self-education and and becoming more worldly and wisdom, if that is the end goal, you have a lot of voids, a lot of holes in your theology. You have a lot of questions that are left unanswered. What about your child who dies? What about when your infant dies? Ray Comfort in that movie, the 180 movie, he says this, finish the sentence for me. It is okay to kill a baby in the womb when? Never. But the wisdom of this world teaches when it has a heartbeat, at 13 weeks, at 30 weeks, ah, why not after he's born? We're just animals anyway, right? Do you see the foolishness of the wisdom of this world? That is a life. It is time to stand for the wisdom of God by becoming a fool to this world. What's going to happen in the world? We look at future events. Where's it all going? Where's it all, where's it all going to end up? The Bible answers this. The Bible teaches us that, that this idea of global warming is in a very weird sense true that things are going to heat up and you're not going to be able to stop it. In fact, it's going to dissolve like jello in the driveway on a summer's day. The Bible teaches what's going to happen. The Bible shares that man is sinful and completely depraved and he cannot fix his own and remedy his own situation. In fact, he cannot come to God. He is at enmity with God. But Jesus Christ came upon the cross and reconciled men unto God. And that's foolishness to the world. Colossians 2 verse 8 says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy... That's also a fancy word for saying the love of wisdom, philosophy, the love of wisdom, and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the world, rather than according to Christ. This morning, friends, I'm exhorting you to cling to Jesus and not by your own strength. I'm trying to show you that today there is a powerful gospel that you adhere to that is not only for the unsaved. Please hear me. Christians need the gospel more, if not more, than the unsaved. We need this beautiful, powerful gospel throughout our lives. A Christian loves the gospel because they know that it is the power of God unto salvation. Philosophy in the ministry has become a joke. 
I remember the first time a pastor asked me, oh, it was uh, so arrogant. It reeked of arrogance. He looked across his desk at me and he said, have you determined your philosophy for ministry? And I'm thinking to myself, and hey, it's not uncommon to hear those words thrown together today. Have you determined your philosophy for ministry yet? Have you put down your philosophy for youth ministry yet? Have you been able to determine the philosophy to which you are going to minister the word of God for the rest of your life? I'm sorry. I didn't realize I needed a philosophy. I have the philosophy right here. It is this word. You stick to the word cr Christian and you will not lose. This is my philosophy. The gospel is my philosophy. I will share the gospel with an unsaved man and I will save, share the gospel with a saved man because I know that it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the food for our soul. It is what keeps us going. And every Sunday morning, which is the first day of the week, by the way, if you are attending a church that does not touch the cross or the gospel, you have not been to church. The saddest hour across this land today is this hour, right now, as pulpits all over the world are void of the word. They're void, they're afraid of the gospel. What has become of us? Methodology in the ministry, it's a joke. Preach the word. Preach the word, Paul said. Paul said in chapter 2, he says, I have determined nothing to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Gospel proclamation is our ministry here at Pleasant Hill Bible Church. We are all about the gospel. The gospel is what changes lives. The gospel is what feeds the soul. The gospel is our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the second part of verse 18. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world or thinks that he is wise in this world, let him become as a fool that he may be wise. That's interesting. So God just told us through his word, let him become a fool that he may be wise. What's he saying here? Any man in our church, any member, any, piece of, any person that's within the Corinthian church, any man among you thinks that he's wise in this world, he's a philosopher, he's a scientist, he's a great orator, he has prefixes before his name. D-R-T-E-T-H-E-O-D. You got all these prefixes in front of everybody's name. That amounts to a hill of beans if you're void of the wisdom of God. But, is Paul saying here, don't pursue, in, in, don't pursue education, don't pursue furthering your knowledge? That is not what he's saying. What he is saying is that if you go and you become a doctor, you better have the biblical worldview to know that you serve a very mighty God. We see across the land today, doctors... Not, not across the board, that's not what I'm saying, but there has become a disconnect. It's more like going to the vet than the doctor's office. There used to be a love there. There used to be a heart tied to the patient and the doctor. There used to be, it wasn't like you were herded into a cattle stall, checked, poked, and pushed out the door. There was an intimacy there. There was a love there between doctor and patient. Something that only comes from God. Because what that doctor used to be ministering to through his doctoral practice was that he was ministering to a child of God. A man created in the image of God. But when we're just animals that have evolved over millions of billions of years, Get them in, ship them out. And I'm not saying that that's across the board. I'm just saying that that's what I've noticed. Culture, education, let him become a fool that he may be wise. This doesn't mean to throw caution to the wind either. This doesn't mean take your car and drive the opposite direction down the highway. 
This doesn't mean begin to take drugs. This doesn't mean play with matches at the gas station. This doesn't mean throw wisdom to the curb. But this does mean Jesus is what Jesus told Peter. He said, he did not say, Peter, you will build my church. Jesus says, Peter, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not stand against it. We get in trouble today, friends. Let me bring it home to you. Let me bring, let me bring this to, to reality here. When we have the mindset that it's our job to build this church, we have now taken the philosophy of the world. Jesus did not tell Peter, you will build my church. Jesus told Peter, I will build my church. You don't get to pick and choose. You stick to the gospel and I will build the church. I made that correlation earlier in the message. I said, if you want them packed, we can pack them. Just be like the world. Let me, po let me pose another factor, the true factor, the biblical factor. You preach the gospel and God will pack them in. You bring the thunder, he'll bring the rain. You plant the seed, he'll make it grow. You stick to this word and you know it front to back and forwards and backwards. You stick to the word and he will build his church. That's the foolishness of the world. That's the foolishness of God. That is the wisdom of God that is foolishness to the world. You want to see this place grow? You want to see people's lives changed? You stick to the gospel. You stand firm for the word of God in a world that does not want the word of God. Have a biblical worldview. Symphonies are nice. I had the privilege of taking my wife to a symphony once to see Bach's uh, Gospel of Luke. It was a wonderful time. It was all in German. I had no idea what they were saying, but it was cool. And we felt very dignified that day. There were a couple guys in there with monocles and things, and I mean, we were like, wow. We're high class living right now, honey. Woohoo! Back to the pickup truck after the show. <laughs> it's the sophistication. There's nothing wrong with symphonies. I love to listen to Bach. In fact, he's probably one of my top five. I love classical music. But when we esteem that position and that, that society, that image that we have as being a member or a, a pursuer of symphonic symphonies, we get in trouble. We're pursuing the wisdom of the world. By the way, Bach was a saved man. Bach was a Christian, and he wrote Christian music. Be careful when we are pursuing the wisdom of this world. The third point that I have for you this, this morning is how to have godly wisdom and Christian unity. How to have godly wisdom and Christian unity. The gospel is what unites. It saves. Remember what Paul said. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To them that believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is why do I keep pulling this rope of the gospel? Yes, people. I've actually had individuals come to me and say. Why is it that you preach salvation every Sunday morning? Number one, because you have to be saved. Number two, the gospel is the power of God, even in the Christian. That's the jet fuel, the drivetrain behind our life, is the gospel. That's why you will not come here on a Sunday morning and not hear the gospel. So how do you know God? How do you, attain, how do you gather godly wisdom, become foolishness to the world, and, and develop and strengthen Christian unity in the church? Number one, you know God. Simple as that. You know his attributes. You know his will. You know his word. His attributes. Friends, he is holy. He is just. He's merciful. He is gracious. He is wrathful. He is sovereign, patient, long-suffering, omniscient. He is all-knowing, what says in verse 20 of the same chapter. He knows the thoughts of this world. Do you think that New Zealand took him by surprise? Not a bit. Mind you what he says here in verse 22. Check it out. Verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, which is Peter, or the world or life, 
or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. If you are in Christ Jesus, his spirit dwells within you. Everything is yours. It doesn't get more united than that. And notice what he says in verse 23. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Do you see what God is doing here? He's building this beautiful package. He's putting everything together in unity. If you can't get along with another brother or sister in Christ here in this world, can I please point out to you that you will not have the opportunity to get, uh, to have, to get along in heaven? One of you or two of you are in your sins. You need to come back to the gospel and have that, I'm all right, shattered. That's what we need. Why do I bring this gospel in front of you every single day, every single Sunday, every time we get together? Because I want it to change your life. I want it to be the power of God unto salvation and the food for your soul as you live as a Christian. It's what unifies. You want to be united in the church? Come back to the gospel. You have to know his will. His will. What's God's will? This is a very interesting thing, and I've just broke it down into two simple points. Of course, I'm not going to be able to tell you, well, it is God's will for you to buy the green Chevy. That's not what I'm saying. God's will here breaks down into two beautiful parts. Number one, that his children would come to salvation. The will of God is that his children would come to salvation, and he brings it to pass. That he rescues a bride that he has, his will was to send his son to pay for sins. And the second part of his will is to glorify himself. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 reads this, working all things according to the counsel of his own will. He's at work. He's at work bringing his children to repentance and faith in him through the preaching of the gospel. Now we're going to move quickly because the clock is again my enemy. How do you know God? How do you attain godly wisdom? How do you have this godly wisdom and seek Christian unity and solidify Christian unity? Number one, you know God. Number two, you ask him for your wisdom. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given. Godly wisdom is not something, but someone. Godly wisdom is not something but someone. We must become a fool in the world's eyes. Literally a moron in the world's eyes. Moroni is that Greek word. We must believe in the crucified Jew. It's, listen to this. What the, what the people of the world see, the, un, the people that do not know Christ, what they see is foolishness. Is they see, why would I believe in a crucified Jew upon a cross? That resurrection that you preach and teach, that's just a fairy tale. You can't prove that. That's what the world teaches. Believing in something that you cannot see or touch. Why would I believe in something that I cannot see or touch? And preaching the gospel? What is that? Why has God ordained this foolishness of preaching to bring those to repentance who are unsaved? Think about it. It's a funny thing what I'm doing right now. I come up before a bunch of people. Preacher comes up before a bunch of people. He stands in front of them with a book in his one hand and nothing in the other. And he begins to exhort and herald and tell the good news from this book. If you think about it, it's kind of a funny thing. It's not normal. You, you, this is, what is the difference between just a man coming up here and preaching from some book and a man coming up here and preaching from this book? The difference is, there's power in this word. There is power, supernatural, spirit-filled power in the preaching of the word of God. And, and I've had even people come up to me and say, well, you're just kind of a little bit preachy. No kidding. That's the way it's got to be. It's as if I come bursting into your house that is on fire and I say, listen, come with me. And you say, I'll accept that. <laughs> Are you out of your mind? You're going to be leaving me out the door. The preacher comes up and stands before you with the word of God. And he says, 
Escape hell through the cross. Come to Christ. Hey, the Redeemer. The Lamb. Flip back a page to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is going to take a beautiful, nice, red, blood-stained ribbon and tie it upon this package for you, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And we will close here. We will close here. And, hey, I'm teaching the next class, too, so we can go all day long. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Please listen to these words. Oh, please listen to these words as we read to the end of the chapter. Why am I so... Why am I so about preaching the word and giving you the gospel? Look what Paul says in the beginning of chapters of 1 Corinthians. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. For unto them which are called, 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 both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For ye see your calling, brethren, calling, 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 how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yeah, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, of him are ye in Christ, Jesus, who of, who of God has made unto us wisdom, there it is again, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen and amen. That's what it's all about, friends. That's why I come every single, this is the highlight, by the way, Sunday is the first day of the week. And what you're saying by coming into this church house is the saying, I need that jet fuel of the gospel to get me through the rest of this week. I need this power of God to charge my soul and send me forth into a world of darkness and stand firmly for the Christ that I have believed upon. The one that has went to the cross and paid for my sins, died, was placed in a borrowed tomb for three days and rose again from the dead. It is him that I stand for. He is my life. He is my being. He is why I exist. That is the power of the gospel. Where do you stand today? Is that the power that fuels you? Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he instructs Timothy. Timothy says, well, how do I do this? How do I do church? What am I supposed to do when we come into church here in Ephesus? And Paul says, preach the word. You want your life to be fueled with this gospel power? Stay to the word. And it'll do it. You want to pack this place? Don't bring in the world. Bring in the gospel. You want to bring people to the light of salvation? You preach Jesus, that he is the only means of salvation to all, the, all who call upon him. We are not out to change the culture. We will never change the sinful culture. We exist to call sinners to repent at the preaching of the word of God. The saddest hour of the week is a pulpit void of the gospel. We don't need stories and colorful illustrations. The time in which we live is in desperate need of the life-giving truth found only in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
For it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You stand by the word of God. You stand for the word of God. And let the chips fall where they may, Christian. We're coming into a time where it is time you must stand for this gospel. God is pleased with the preaching of the cross of his son. He is pleased with the blood and when it's preached. And friends, there, is no, there are lies. There lies the difference between every religion in this entire planet and the true religion of the faith, uh, of the Christian faith. There has been blood. Sacrificial, substitutionary, vicarious, atoning blood. God's, justified, God's justice was satisfied in the bruising of his own son. The preacher is a herald of the good news. He's something that he is a changed man and he desires to see change in men. He cannot sit still. He cannot contain. He must tell you of the redemption that is found only in Jesus. In Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones classic book, Preaching and Preachers, he defines preaching as this. Preaching is theology on fire. If you can't tell that I'm fired up for this word, you've got to open your eyes. Preaching is theology on fire. There must be a supernatural fire built wherever you hear the word of God preached. If it's in this church or another church, if I never see you again and today's my last day, wherever you go to church, they must bring the heat of the word of God. They must stand for the gospel. It is my motive to stab you in the heart with this word that you may be slain by it and your inability to work your way to heaven. Look out when you go to church to be entertained. The central focus of any moment in the church house must be the word of the living God. The message is the sun and our universe orbits his word. Paul wasn't afraid to preach the full counsel of God. It is said that all texts lead to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the kind of thing that causes amens to erupt out of heaven. If you have been to a church service that is void of the gospel and void of the cross, you have not been to church. God cannot be dethroned and he will not be dethroned. He is worthy, his word is worthy, and he is powerful. But the foolishness, but this is foolishness to the world. What I've told you up until now is foolishness to the world. You know what I say to that? Who cares? I'll keep standing for this word until he calls me home. To them that are saved, it is the power of, the God, of God Almighty. God is calling his elect from the four corners of the world by the foolishness of preaching the gospel. It is all about him. It is all about him. I'll close with this. I have so much more that I want to share with you, but our time is gone. We are not justified by works. We are justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, by grace alone. And if you're working for anything other than that, friend, that's not the gospel. It's easy to send missionaries to Africa and China and Peru, but we, sit, we fail to see from our pew the millions who are going to hell every day from our own neighborhoods. You may be saying to yourself, well, I don't really see a problem in our own community. Let me be the first to say to you that that is the wisdom of this world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is true and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you for it, Lord, and the depth and the richness that is found only in you. May this word sink deep into our heart as you say the seed does. I pray, Lord, that you would water, that you would grow, and that you would change hearts even in this man right now by the power of your gospel. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for going to the cross and dying for our sins that we may be set free from the bondage that's found therein. We are your slaves, Lord. We are owned by you. Cause us to stand by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take your hymnals if you would.